Hello everybody, welcome to part B of lecture 35. Let's take a look at the dilution of the dollar in the 1950s and 1960s. Okay, so after the signing of the Bretton Woods Agreement in July 1944, there's no question about it. The dollar is king, the dollar is dominant, the dollar is the world's reserve currency, the dollar is the only currency directly convertible into gold, and all other national currencies are pegged essentially to this gold-backed dollar. The dollar is strong. The dollar is dominant after World War II. Here's a uh, Life magazine cover from July 1945. Ten cents as a strong dollar. Within a generation, a magazine's going to cost a lot more than ten cents. But immediately after the war, that is the strength of the dollar. New York City, financial capital of the world. Okay, so in the late 1940s, in the, in the years immediately after Bretton Woods, all the allied countries who agreed to Bretton Woods uh, uh, adhered to the new system of fixed exchange rates and, and adopting the dollar as world's reserve currency. Late 1940s, the U.S. dollar, besides being a reserve currency, was far and away the hardest currency in the world. It has a lot of value and a lot of people really, really want dollars. Worldwide demand for dollars is off the charts. And so really the dollar has more value than gold. And, uh, and, and in fact, actually with the gold price at $35 an ounce, the US dollar was even a bit undervalued compared to gold. Gold was a bit overvalued. This is, uh, you know, the, dar the dollar was so hard in those days that you could, you had five and dime stores, your nickel and your dime would actually you know, go somewhere and could actually buy something, unlike today where it serves the purposes of very, very small change. Back in those days, it could, it could buy something of substance. Here's some coins in the early 1950s. Silver dime, silver quarter, silver half dollar featuring Benjamin Franklin and the uh, Liberty Bell. But there was a problem to, the, to this phenomenon of a, of a hard dollar. And because a hard dollar meant dollars were scarcer. Now, the problem with the scarce dollar was that the entire international monetary system now under Bretton Woods is centered around the dollar. And so in the late 1940s, there was quite a severe dollar shortage in world markets, or what some economists have called the dollar gap. Now, I mentioned just two slides back that the, that the dollar in fact, was a bit undervalued in the United States in the late 1960s, in the late 1940s. Uh, and this undervalued dollar in the U.S., anytime you have an undervalued currency, that encourages exports and discourages imports. And so this had quite a, uh, a stimulating effect on U.S. exports. The U.S. has far and away the, the greatest manufacturing capacity. U.S. Uh, uh, technology was second to none, and so Americans didn't have much incentive at all to buy foreign imported goods. And so the United States is just exporting, 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 and running huge trade surpluses. The problem with that, for foreigners needed dollars to support their currencies, but also needed dollars to buy American goods. People wanted, you know, people in Japan and Western Germany and France and England, they wanted American cars, they wanted American steel, they wanted American machinery, but they don't have the dollars, they don't have the liquidity to, to do so. How does the U.S. respond to this? Well, they need to get dollars out there, right? We need, we need dollars to begin to accumulate in world markets. One way to do that would, would be would be to encourage Americans to import more goods from abroad, but Americans aren't quite interested in that at the moment. Another way to get dollars moving out there, injected into the world system, would be through foreign aid. And in 1948, Secretary of State George Marshall spearheaded the so-called Marshall Plan, European recovery supplied by the United States of America. This, this uh, logo here was used on American aid packages to Europe. This was a $12 billion program financed through money printing, financed through Federal Reserve uh, creation of new dollars. And this $12 billion was injected into the Western European economies to rebuild after the war and, and hopefully also to stave off 
communist movements because if Western European economies collapse or if they did very poorly, there was a real th threat of a communist takeover in those countries. And so this was a key part of U.S. foreign policy, but also a key part of U.S. monetary policy and getting dollars, uh, making dollars available for these countries to then support their national currencies, but then to also to also buy U.S. products. Another way to get dollars out there uh, was to encourage multinational corporations to uh, based in America, but to build plants outside of America. And so multinationals began building plants outside of America, which which exported dollars overseas. Now, beginning in the early 1950s and continuing for a good 15, 20 year long period, the Fed began a policy of deliberately uh, softening the dollar. The U.S. government wants, wants dollars to begin flowing out of the country, wants liquidity provided to world markets, and the Fed finances that by softening the dollar, by printing essentially more dollars. By the mid to late 1950s, as the dollar softened, the dollar went from being undervalued in the United States, which, ex which encouraged trade surpluses, and went from being undervalued to being overvalued. And all of a sudden, as the dollar began to soften, it relative to gold, it was, it was quite a bit weaker. And so the, the dollar more and more became overvalued in the United States, and an overvalued currency encourages trade deficits. And so really beginning in the mid-1950s and, and expanding in the late 1950s, the U.S. begins running trade deficits, and, and the U.S., began Americans more and more were exporting dollars overseas to purchase foreign imports. As dollars piled up overseas, as the dollar softened and dollars became more common in foreign markets, confidence in the dollar began to decline. And this in turn resulted in increased outflows of gold from the United States as more and more people began to question whether or not the U.S. could purchase or could redeem dollars at thirty-five in gold at thirty-five dollars an ounce. So you, you almost had this dilemma here, or, or even a paradox, where if you had a hard dollar, there's not enough liquidity in the system, and and uh, and, 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 it, and world markets are drying up. But then if you soften the dollar, then confidence in the, in the dollar will decline and that's gonna to lead to foreign central banks wanting to redeem those dollars in gold because gold now has more value relative to a dollar. It's, the Bretton Woods was a, 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 a faulty system, okay? It was a faulty system from the beginning and, and just didn't, could not quite work. But yeah, by the 1950s, 1960s, the dollar is definitely beginning to soften. And uh, here's a, this will, you know, illustrates exactly what that looked like. So the constant here is the purchasing power of a dollar in 1945. So in 1945, a good that an item that you could you could purchase for one dollar in 1945, by 1950 you now needed a dollar 33. By 1955, to purchase that same item that you could formerly buy at one dollar, you now needed a dollar fifty. And then by 1965, to purchase a good that you could buy for $1 in 1945, you now needed $1.75. That is a fairly steady erosion in the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. And it happens fairly, fairly rapidly, all right? And it's in response to this former dollar gap. And, and but the dollar gap is converted into a dollar glut. And this dollar glut in, by the 1960s, as there are almost too many dollars overseas, because the dollars become so soft, the dollar glut's going to lead to just more and more gold leaving the US. But also, it, it introduces a problem in, in the coinage, because the United States still has silver in the dimes and quarters. Well, as the dollar gets softer, 
the silver as a, and to state state differently as a dollar loses value the silver that was in the dimes and in the quarters has more value than 10 cents or 25 cents okay so the intrinsic value of the silver metal that's inside a dime or inside a quarter has more is is more valuable than 10 cents or 25 cents what does that mean gresham's law people began hoarding dimes and quarters because they knew the intrinsic value of this coin is greater than its extrinsic value and so by the late 1950s there was a real shortage of dimes and quarters into the in the united states the shortage really began around 1959 and there's a widespread hoarding of of these coins now here are the coins more and more difficult to it to obtain because the silver was worth more than the extrinsic value of those coins well congress responded in 1965 so they held it off for as long as they could for a few years and then in 1965 they responded with debasement coinage act of 1965 all of the silver content in a dime and a quarter were removed no more silver in the dime and a quarter instead uh, the dime and a quarter had a core of of copper and then were clad with a, a composition of copper and nickel by the way congress didn't have to do this okay one way to have responded would would have been to make the dollar harder they could have made the dollar harder they could have strengthened the value of the dollar but that would have required increased interest rates or required soaking in some of that excess money and that's that can be a, a difficult uh, that could be uh, some bitter medicine to take it can be a difficult uh, decision to act upon and so they went the other route and said you know what let's just remove the silver and that's what they did the same act coin coinage act of 1965 also reduced the silver content in the half dollar now when after jfk's assassination Congress wanted to honor JFK by putting him on the half dollar. This is uh, a, a, initially before 1965, the half dollar was made of 90% silver. After 1965, it was 40% silver. And then in a separate act in 1970, the silver was eliminated from the half dollar altogether. Now this had a lot of opposition at the time um even though it it passed congress pretty easily you had some congressmen who were very against it there was a congressman from idaho who uh during the debates prepared a chart and the chart showed the debasement of the roman denarius and this congressman argued hey look it, it, look at what happened to rome once rome started debasing a coinage their empire began to fall and the same thing's going to happen here we're going to look back at this act of 1965 and it's going to be you know this was a seminal event where we began to debase the coinage i don't think we should do this congress passed it anyway another congressman from nevada when uh pointed to uh the fact that now the treasury with all the silver is going to was the treasury's plan was to sell the silver to cutlery companies because you don't need it for quarters or dimes anymore uh, so sell it to a cutlery company to make silverware silver spoons and silver forks this congressman from nevada said i would rather eat with chopsticks than take the silver out of our coinage i love that it's pretty pretty uh amusing comment there from the congressman from nevada so the co the silver was taken out of the coinage here's a stack of u.s coins half dollars with the silver these are fully silver and these are the new copper nickel coins and you can tell you can see the copper core right there so this is a debased coinage a debased coinage after 1965. the first year or two some of these silver coins pre-1965 silver dimes and quarters remained in circulation but more and more became scarce and within a couple of years they were just out of circulation because nobody would ever want to spend a silver dime or silver quarter when you could spend a lesser valued copper nickel composition dime or copper nickel quarter gresham's law right 
Gresham's Law, bad money, here's the bad money, chases out good money, here's the good money. The good money left, the bad money took over. And so you can still find silver dimes and silver quarters, just not in circulation. You can go to coin shops and buy them for several dollars a piece. Okay, so uh, dollars losing value. And then in the mid, mid to late 1960s, it really begins to, to accelerate. Uh, the federal government was spending a lot of money, heavy, heavy deficit spending by the federal government. You had the, Viet the beginning of the Vietnam War, very expensive war, as well as the Great Society domestic programs, financed by borrowing and by money printing. More and more dollars are entering the system. There is now a dollar glut, a dollar glut. So that by 1970, to buy an item that formerly you could buy for $1 in 1945, you now needed $2.15. It's a pretty rapid fall in the, in the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. So next time, Part C, I'm actually going to record it tomorrow. So uh, running off the class right now, wasn't able to record Part C in time. Part C of Lecture 35, we'll take a look at the Nixon shock, the Nixon shock, the closing of the gold window. What led to that? What events led to the closing of the gold window in 1971? I will see you there. So long. Bye.